It's the Sunday after Easter Sunday. Is it up there? Oh, I got to forward it. <laughs> now is it up there? There we go. Okay. <laughs> I think Brent and I were flicking at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, though, for your help. Appreciate it. <laughs> Here it is. The Sunday after Easter Sunday. One week has passed by. I'm going to give you the top ten ways that you know it is the Sunday after Easter Sunday. A few of them are funny. Some of them are kind of tongue-in-cheek. Some of them are only funny because they're true. Uh, but here we go. Number ten. How do you know it's the Sunday after Easter Sunday? Well, you go to store the store and all the Easter candy is 75% off. Number nine, you know it's the Sunday after Easter Sunday because you don't have trouble finding a parking spot at the church building. Number eight, you don't have trouble finding a seat even if you're late. Number seven, no one is wearing a new outfit. Number six, the number of visitors drops dramatically, although I have seen a number of visitors here this morning, so I'm thankful for that. We can scratch that one off the list. Number five, how you know today is the Sunday after Easter, is you can walk right into your favorite restaurant and be seated immediately. Number four, there were no Facebook posts about the resurrection. Anybody see one? I didn't either. Number three, the Easter eggs that were not found last Sunday were found yesterday by the lawnmower. Number two, the people we thought were visitors last week but were really members are not here this morning. And number one, the tomb is still empty, and it's still a reason to celebrate. In our text this morning, John chapter 20, we have one week, the Sunday after Resurrection Sunday, and you have the apostles together again, plus one who was not with them when Jesus appeared on that first Sunday, Thomas. And he told them, unless I see Jesus... Unless I can put my fingers in the hands and his holes and my hand in the side of, it, uh, of the, the, um, the, where the spear stuck him on the side, I will not believe. And they're assembled together, presumably maybe in the same room. The door is locked. Then all of a sudden, Jesus appears. And Thomas, any doubt, is gone. And he saw, and he put his finger in the holes and his hand in his side, and it caused him to proclaim, my Lord and my God. Was that Sunday any less miraculous or any less better or any less amazing than the Sunday before when the resurrection actually took place? I would say no. I would say it was just as exciting, maybe even more so for Thomas. Today's not any different than last Sunday when you think about it. It's just a week later. But the temptation is to treat Easter like it's an ending. The new clothes have been bought. Everyone is dressed and ready. We went to church. The eggs have been found. The candy has been eaten. Jesus is risen. Now I can eat sugar again, binge Netflix, and get on social media again. Finally, life is back to normal. Right? Finally. By mid-afternoon on Easter, the joy has waned and the excitement of the resurrection has faded. But without the resurrection of Jesus, his sacrifice for sin is incomplete. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile or vain, and you, all of us, we are still in our sin, lost, without hope, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17 the resurrection of Jesus is central to our faith. Central to our faith. If it's gone, Christianity crumbles to the ground. And we might as well not be here this morning. We might as well be eating, drinking, and being merry if the resurrection didn't take place. We are here, though, exactly one week after Easter Sunday. Are we any different? What does the resurrection of Jesus mean to you? Is your life different because of the resurrection? 
What kind of impact did the resurrection have on your life this week? Did you do anything differently because Jesus is still alive? The resurrection of Jesus, it changes everything. I want to look at this morning three ways that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Not just some things, not just most things, not just everything but just a few things, but how Jesus' resurrection changes everything. Or at least it ought to in our lives. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus declared that He is the Son of God. He, not just that He claimed to be the Son of God, but the resurrection proved that He was the Son of God or is the Son of God. Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 4 that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection proved that He is the Son of God. It is that He is who He said He was. All throughout the New Testament, where I say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are several places where Jesus claimed to be God. That He is the Messiah. That He is the Son of the Father. Several times throughout the New Testament. And while people may have doubted, and there may have been a little bit of room there for some doubt, the resurrection vindicated Jesus as God in the flesh who came into the world to bring healing, salvation, and to usher in the kingdom. The body of the saved, the group of people that Jesus is coming back to rescue and to take home. And within that framework, that Jesus is the Son of God, the resurrection was God's stamp of approval on the sacrifice of Jesus. Raising Him from the dead was God's way of accepting Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf. Look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 24. We'll start at verse 23. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses. In other words, he was sacrificed because of our sin and then raised for our justification. How do I know that my sins are forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus? Paul says, because the Father raised Him from the dead. It's how we know that that sacrifice was and has been accepted on our behalf. And we don't have to worry about anything. There's not anything that we can do in return to earn uh, forgiveness. But God raised Him from the dead. We can know that we've been forgiven. The resurrection proved Jesus to be God. And that his once and all sacrifice of sin was accepted by the Father. And that changes everything. It changes everything. It means I have a life-changing decision to make. Every one of us. Every person that's walking the face of the earth at this moment has a life-changing decision to make. Either I make Jesus my King, King of my life, and I experience His forgiveness, or I don't. And I will experience His judgment. It changes everything. God has laid a choice before me. We, uh, somebody said uh, in our Wednesday night class that, that God has put the ball back in our court. And He has. You and I get to make that decision. I can make Jesus King in my life and experience freedom and salvation and everything that heaven has to offer. Or I can refuse it. And I will experience eternal separation from God. The resurrection proves Jesus as the Son of God. Number two, the resurrection empowers us to live victoriously till Jesus returns. Open your Bibles to Romans 8. Romans 8. 
Romans 8 is a beautiful chapter. I would encourage you to, to go home and read all of it this afternoon, but we don't have time to read all of it now, just a few verses. We're going to start in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Let's skip down to verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now look at what he says in between this. We're going to look at verses 10 and 11 now. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and it does if you are a New Testament Christian, he says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Those who have participated in in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, have the Spirit of God living within us, and we are empowered by His Spirit to live as Jesus lived. How can I love others the way that Jesus loved others? Because I have the Spirit within me. How can I show compassion to those that, the way that Jesus showed compassion? Because I have the Spirit living within me. How can I be merciful? How can I do everything, not everything, but live as Jesus lived and show the same uh, character uh, and all those things? How can I do that? Because I have the Spirit. The same Spirit that lived in Jesus and raised Him from the dead is the same Spirit that lives in me as a New Testament Christian. And He empowers me to live a victorious life. Not a sinless life, but a victorious life. One where I do not have to give in to the desires of the flesh, but I can walk in the desires of the Spirit. And I can show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because as Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I don't have to be enslaved to my fleshly desires. I don't have to be unloving, impatient, full of anger and wrath and vengeful. I don't have to be all those because I have the Spirit of God living within me. And if I walk in the Spirit, I'm going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And people are going to see that there's something different about me. And that changes everything. Through the resurrection of Jesus, I have been made alive with Christ and seated with Him in the heavenly places. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Start in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and has seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Flip back a page to chapter 1 and verse 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but in the one to come. That's not the verse I wanted to read. Verse 3. I don't know why I did verse 21. (laughs) Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're already victorious in Christ because of the resurrection. You and I may be seated physically in pews, but spiritually we are seated with Jesus in the heavenly places and reigning with Him. We are not only part of a kingdom, we are reigning in the kingdom of God. 
And we are living triumphantly and victoriously through Jesus. The world has no claim on me. I'm a child of God. And the one in me is far more powerful than the one in the world. 1 John 4 and verse 4. The resurrection of Jesus trumps any and all other power in my life. The resurrection empowers me. It empowers you to live victoriously in this life. But number three, the resurrection means there will be a bodily resurrection either to life or to death. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the only chapter in in the New Testament, or really in the Bible, that is dedicated completely to the resurrection. Everything in here is about the resurrection. Look at verse 20 and 21. Apparently there were some uh, at the Corinth church that had been deceived in thinking that there was no such thing as the resurrection or that Jesus had not been resurrected. And so Paul goes into that and and talks about that. But verse 20 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. That idea of first fruits. Jesus is the first one to be resurrected from the dead, never to die again, thus guaranteeing our own resurrection. It will take place and I'll be resurrected either to life or resurrected to death Paul wrote to the Philippians and said but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body Philippians uh, chapter 3 20 and 21 but back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15 Paul says if you go Uh, to verse 51 behold I tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye in other words instantaneously it'll be just like that we will be changed at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable And this mortal body will put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And then verse 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says we're going to be changed. We're all going to be resurrected. And in a moment, the twinkling of an eye will all be changed. There's going to be a bodily resurrection. And every person who has ever lived, beginning with Adam, will be resurrected from the dead. Jesus said this, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Look at Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 30. Paul says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. And he tells us why. Why does God want us to change our lives? Why does God want us to allow Jesus and the Spirit to transform us? And he tells us why. Verse 31. Because he has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to us or to all by raising him from the dead. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Why does God want us to change? Why does He want us to to put our faith in Jesus? Because there's coming a day when everybody's going to be raised from the dead and Jesus is going to judge us in righteousness. 
And we know from Matthew 25, there's going to be a separation, the sheep from the goats. The ones who did the will of God and those who rejected the will of God. Knowing that Jesus will return and our physical bodies will be resurrected and Jesus will judge the world, it changes everything. It should change everything about how we perceive life. The reality means every decision I make matters. The big decisions and even the smallest of insignificant decisions. Because the smaller ones build up and help you make the big ones. It matters. It matters whether I cheat on my taxes. It matters whether I short, sh- or shortcut a business deal. It matters whether I use profanity. It matters what I look at on social media. It matters what I think about others. It matters whether I serve in the kingdom or I don't serve in the kingdom. It matters if I'm patient, meek, humble, kind, and compassionate. It matters the kind of things that I fill my mind and my heart with. It matters what kind of example I am. And we could keep going. But I think you get the point. The fact, the reality, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead points to a future reality that all of us will be resurrected from the dead. And there's going to be a separation The sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous, the believers from the unbelievers, the holy from the unholy, those who embraced Jesus and His way of life, and those who rejected Jesus and His way of life. And we could keep describing it in different ways, but that reality changes everything. It changes how we process life. The choices we make matter because Jesus is coming back. And that's not meant to scare you. It's not meant to produce fear in you. Matter of fact, it's meant to do the other. It's meant to give you hope. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. Starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The fact that we will be resurrected from the dead and there will be a separation isn't meant to instill fear in you. It's meant to give you hope that there's something better than this life. There's something that will outlive everything that we have here. And it's relationship with God, the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. The resurrection changes everything. Nothing was normal, quote, normal, after Jesus. Nothing was normal after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. When a man who claims to be God rises from the dead, business as usual isn't a thing anymore because it changes the world. Followers, for followers of Jesus, the resurrection isn't celebrated once a year it's celebrated every single day and corporately we celebrate it together every first day of the week for followers of jesus the resurrection isn't about making an appearance in new pastel suits or blouses it's about a reality a new reality of life hope forgiveness and victory over eternal death For followers of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus is reality that alters life on a fundamental level. It's transformative. It revolutionizes how we perceive and process life. It brings clarity and purpose to our very being. It means everything that we do matters to God. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. With that in mind, ask yourself this question. How is, or how are blank, 
impacted by the reality of Jesus' resurrection? How is my calendar impacted by the resurrection of Jesus? How is my marriage impacted by the resurrection of Jesus? How's my job impacted by the resurrection of Jesus? How are my choices impacted by the reality of Jesus' resurrection? How are my relationships changed or impacted by the reality of the resurrection of Jesus? How are my everyday, day in and day out, week in, week out, frustrations impacted by the reality of Jesus' resurrection? I think you get the point. But you can fill in the blank for yourself. But the question is, since the resurrection of Jesus changes everything, what has it changed about your life? How has it changed you? How has it changed your heart? How has it changed your mind? How has it changed the choices that you make? Are you living a victorious and resurrected life by faith in the resurrection of Jesus? This morning, here we are, a week after Resurrection Sunday, is it still important to you? Is it still life-changing to you? Are you still thinking about it? Maybe you haven't. Maybe the resurrection of Jesus hasn't changed much in your life. It should. Maybe you're ready to make some things right with God because of that. Maybe you haven't taken advantage of of the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus in your life yet. And you realize that you're still in your sin. But because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, your sins can be forgiven. You can take advantage of what Jesus has done. Matter of fact, that's why He did it. So you can take advantage of it because you can't do it on your own. And you're ready to profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and ready to make Him King of your life. And to let Him change your life, to transform it, to turn it upside down. And you're ready to be immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to walk a victorious life, immersed in Jesus. Whatever your need is, we encourage you to please come forward while we stand and while we sing.